Welcome to worship with us today. Please know that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at First Congregational United Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are grateful that you chose to be with us for worship. Today is the fourth Sunday in our six week preaching series, Extraordinary Ministries During Ordinary Time. Any and all virtual worship services can be accessed by going to the First Congregational UCC Madison YouTube channel. Today we celebrate the Sacrament of Communion during our worship. Please pause now to gather your elements if you have not already done so. Let us now enter our time of worship together.
please join in the call to worship. Jesus surprised the people at the wedding. They were sure, sure they, they would, would be, be disappointed. disappointed. They thought that their host wasn't prepared for their needs. We, we aren't much different. different. We, we depend, depend on God for miracles. God, help us look within ourselves for ordinary gifts. Help, help us recognize the power of the ordinary for extraordinary blessings. When we meet for worship in person, we greet each other with signs of peace. The scriptures tell us that this peace passes our human means of understanding. And yet in faith, this ordinary gesture sends extraordinary intention out into the world. Let us now take a moment to think about the people our offerings of peace might touch. And now we join our voices to say, May the peace of God be with us all. Please join in the unison prayer. Dreaming and confident God, each day we awake expecting the day to be ordinary. We long for consistency, yet hope for pleasant surprises. We give thanks that you sent Jesus, not only to understand the flow of our everyday lives, but to give substance to your dreams of a better world a healthier world, more loving interactions between people, and the value of every part of creation. As we hear and retell our sacred stories, help us to dream of ways the ordinary can become extraordinary. Each story, each day, offers us the chance to reset the trajectory of our own lives and how we interact with creation. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Hello, everybody, and welcome. It's so great to have you here. So great to have you here. All right, I'm coming to you today from a mystery room in the building, in the church building. I'll explain a little bit later, but right now it's just a mystery room, okay? So today I want to talk about parents, grandparents, guardians, okay? How many of you have a parent or a grandparent or a guardian, somebody who helps make sure you're in the right place at the right time, okay? Make sure you have food and a shelter, okay? How many of you have that, okay? Now, sometimes these parents or grandparents or guardians also are there to nudge us to try something or nudge us to do something, even if we really don't want to do it, all right? So think about that. So, and today we're going to talk about the scripture reading today. It talks about Jesus and his mother, Jesus and his mother. Okay, and how his mother Mary sort of nudged him into doing something. So Jesus was at this party with his friends. He was having, relaxing, having a good time. And his mother was also at that party, okay? And his mother comes up to him and says, Jesus, I need you to do something because only you can do this. And Jesus is like, well, mother, leave me alone. I'm having fun with my friends. And his mother insists, no, Jesus, you're the only one who can do this. I know, I know you're the only one who can do this. Oh, mother, just leave me alone. And Jesus' mother insisted, insisted, until he finally gave in and he did what she wanted to do. All right? And things went big from there for Jesus. So his mother sort of nudged him into doing something, even if he wasn't really interested in doing it. That's what guardians and parents and grandparents are there for, to sort of nudge us into things. And that leads us to the mystery room we're in today. So I'm going to put up a picture of a son and his mother, okay? Take a look at that. Can anybody tell me who this son and mother are? Any ideas? Any ideas? Okay. Maybe a couple thoughts, okay? So I'm going to show you something, and maybe this will be a hint. Okay, can you see what this is? This is a light bulb. Oh, somebody got it. Yes. That little boy was Thomas Edison and his mother, okay? Thomas Edison, who helped invent the light bulb or give us a light bulb that we could use. So Thomas Edison was a genius. He was a genius, I tell you, okay? But the problem was when he was a little boy, well, he had struggles with learning. And um, if he if today he might, he might be dyslexic or have trouble with learning things, he learned in a different way than the teachers were used to. So some of the teachers actually told his mother, actually told his mother that this Thomas Edison kid, he's, he's not smart. No, he's not going to amount to anything. You, you know, may as well just take him home and humor him because we can't teach him anything. He's not going to amount to anything. And his mother... Thomas's Edison mother went ballistic and she was not happy. She knew her son was smart, like really, really smart. And he, so she pushed, she pushed. In fact, when schools wouldn't take him anymore because he was, he, he was not smart enough to be in school, she would, she would teach him at school, excuse me, at home. Thomas Edison's mother would homeschool him until she found a school that would take him. All right, so there, and so can you picture Thomas Edison going, oh, I don't want to go to school, and his mother saying, you are going to school, young man, because I know you're smart. You can do this. And because of Thomas Edison's mother's urging and pushing, look what we have today, light bulbs, and all kinds of electrical cool things that Thomas Edison and his group of people working together created. And that leads us to where we are today. We are in the electrical room of First Congregational Church, deep down in the basement. All the wires and electrical stuff run through this room to make sure power works so Don can play his organ um, and play preludes and postludes and hymns. And so uh, Anne and Aldana can be seen because the lights come down on them. All kinds of things happen that come through this room. 
and all because of the urging, the nudging, of Thomas Edison's mother. So, remember that. Sometimes when we're not sure about doing the stuff, or know what's, what we should do, what's right to do, sometimes we have to listen to that voice that's coming to us that may come in the voice of our mother, our father, a grandparent, a guardian, okay, an aunt or uncle, and it's an urging. You need to do this. Sometimes we need that. All right? Remember that. Let's pray. Great and loving and urging God, thank you for all those voices, all those urges, nudging from people who love us, pushing us forward, knowing that we can do more, even when we're not sure we can. Help us to remember that, that they are sent by you. We all need a nudge sometime. Thank you. Amen. All right, we'll see you next time. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, every color. Hear these words from the Newer Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out, and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tested the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditation that lives deep in all of our hearts always be acceptable to you, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Today is the fourth Sunday in our six-week preaching series, Extraordinary Ministries During Ordinary Time. We realize this time in history is far from ordinary. Ordinary time refers to this time in the church's liturgical calendar between significant Christian holidays. Ordinary time is when our sacred texts lead us to have conversations about Jesus' ministry. And often his ministry is quite extraordinary. The text today is no exception to witnessing the extraordinary actions Jesus takes in his ministry. The story starts in an ordinary way, with Jesus, his mother, and the disciples going to a wedding. While at the wedding, somehow Jesus' mother finds out the wine has run out. We don't know how she is privy to this information, 
but she is. And she calls on Jesus to help. His response is a little surprising. Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. Mary seemingly ignores Jesus' answer, turning to the wait staff to say, do whatever he tells you. As she speaks to the wait staff, I imagine her hand holding his arm because a mother's work is never done. She is known from the moment of her pregnancy that this child Jesus has is to be great. In fact, was to be a king. Maybe she wasn't even thinking miracle. Perhaps she just wanted him to run to the store to purchase more wine. What happens next becomes the extraordinary part of the story. What was once ordinary water now becomes something very extraordinary. This symbolism is more than just water becoming wine. The symbolism of this story is about change and big change. Although Jesus may not have thought this was the moment he was to begin his ministry, if that's what he was referring to by not being his hour yet, his mother had other thoughts. She was the nudge that pushed him to do what we hear to be the first of many signs of change. There are many threads of this story we could follow and talk about the symbolism. Today, I would like to focus on the changes that occurred in the story. We begin with Jesus changing his mind. This was not his plan. At the beginning of the story, Jesus is just fine letting the chips fall wherever they need to fall. What concern is this of ours? For at least a moment in time, Jesus doesn't think he plays a role in the remedy of the shortage of wine. But after the nudge from his mother, he not only changes his mind, but he starts a ripple effect of change. Next, he chooses the stone jars. He asks the wait staff to fill the empty jars with water. Why not use all of the empty wine skins that are laying around? Because that doesn't make any kind of point as his as he begins his ministry. Stone vessels were common in Judea for ritual purposes, since according to the law of Moses, stone would not become impure, unlike the often used pottery of ancient times. The water could be stored in a large stone jar, which would function like a cistern holding ritually clean water. Then later it could be used for purification. The primary purpose of these washing rituals was to become spiritually clean or holy rather than physically clean. But these jars were empty. We don't know if the purification water had been used for the wedding feast or whether the family had chosen to no longer continue the ritual and they were just sitting to the side empty. The purpose of these stone jars, once holding water for purification, has now changed. If they were being used, the jars are now tainted. If they were not being used, the jars have been filled for a new and different purpose. And finally, pure water was changed into something new and different. 
It is no longer ordinary water. In the story, the wine taken to the chief steward appears to have changed from water into wine. And not just ordinary wine, but the best wine, extraordinary wine. In doing this, Jesus saved the wedding festival from coming to a grinding halt, and he saved the hosts and the newly married couple from tremendous shame and embarrassment. But Jesus also did this miracle to show his disciples and those closest to him something about who he was and what he came to do. Most of the wedding guests and even the host of the wedding festival probably did not even know that this miracle had taken place. But his followers and his family who were there with him saw Jesus use empty, no longer used religious vessels and fill them with something that brought joy. And this is a beautiful picture of who Jesus is and what he came to do. This is a story about how things can be different if we are open to change. United Methodist Church Minister Galen Zook said, Jesus didn't come to institute rigorous religious requirements, nor did he come to do away with all of the old religious systems altogether. He came to take what was old and make it new again. He came to bring fresh vision and purpose to what had become empty and meaningless. He came to bring abundant life and joy. Jesus came, as we so often notice in our sacred texts, to turn things upside down. He often uses ordinary opportunities to make extraordinary changes in how we see the world. As individuals and as a church, we sometimes fall into old habits and rituals and are hesitant to change. I'm sure you have heard the seven words of a dying church are, but we've always done it this way. We fall victim to rinse and repeat instead of asking the question, why are we doing it this way? Could we do it better? And what might that look like? At a personal level, Zook continued, maybe there was a time when you read your Bible regularly, but it, now it's just laying there gathering dust. Maybe you used to pray every day, but it seemed like your prayers just weren't being answered. Or maybe you just got busy, and so you stopped doing it. Maybe you used to find a lot of joy in doing good things for others, but it seems like they don't appreciate what you're doing for them, so you're tempted to give up. Over the last year and a half, we have had our own wedding feast that ran out of wine. We personally and definitely as a church were given an incredible gift by the pandemic. Mary didn't nudge us, the pandemic did. The Sunday ritual had to change. The way we did church had to change. Our personal lives had to change. We could no longer just drink the wine handed out at the wedding feast. We had to figure out what to do to replenish the wine so church could continue. We learned a new technology and we are in the midst of preparation for a hybrid worship experience. Through Zoom, people have been able to attend meetings 
no matter where they were, and even during bad weather. Past members and even extended family have been able to worship with us every week. First Congregational United Church of Christ has reached lives we never knew we could touch. We have been able to attend important services like weddings, confirmations, baptisms, and memorials we may not have been able to attend in person. We have learned the value of young people's minds, teaching us how to easily access the world more rapidly and with a wider net. Without this nudge, who knows how long it would have taken us to welcome change. And it has also helped us understand what is important in our long-held rituals. The boards and staff of the church have taken on a process recently of evaluating what events, ministries, and rituals are important to hold and what we can let go of following this time of change. We are reluctant, just as we hear from Jesus in his first response. What worry, of, what worry is this of ours? Let someone else do it. Change? Why change? Jesus recognized there was an emptiness, not only in the jars, but in the lives of the people. He wants to fill those places in the lives of God's people with new wine. Our days have been anything but ordinary over the last 16 months. And I'm not sure we are completely out of the woods yet. But it is time to take the nudge to look around us and to consider what needs to be changed in our own lives and in the life of the church. What are the empty jars that need to be filled with fresh ideas, maybe even better ideas? If we were waiting for Mary's nudge, it has been given to us. Jesus' extraordinary ministry reminds us that together, in our ordinary lives, with ordinary gifts, we can do extraordinary things. Amen. Christ's invitation is simple. Sit down where you are. You don't need to run off somewhere else, not a nearby village market or a familiar sanctuary. 
Communion is where you are. Sit down. The disciples complained. It is a deserted place and the hour is late. Jesus said, they need not go away. No one needs to go away. No one is deserted and no one is late. Not you who are alone because you are vulnerable to virus or you who would feel alone even in a not distancing crowd because something has made your life a wilderness. Jesus has compassion on every crowd, healing them, even the hungry, one by one by one. Here is green grass, someone to help you sit down, someone to help you stand up again, someone to bless communion so it will be enough, and break it into pieces you can handle. Sit down where you are. We remember Jesus Christ played vintner at a wedding feast, rubbed elbows with Zacchaeus' friends, expanded the disciples' understanding of the hope recipe in bread crust and fish scraps. And then, when they forgot, did it again. We always remember a Passover in Jerusalem when Jesus borrowed an upper room, soaked and scrubbed the tired feet of others, and explained that there is a God-shaped hole in everyone's belly, and Jesus would fill it with love. Remembering is beautiful, but there is not much taste in it. Let us stop running to nearby villages with our hunger and thirst and sit down here and now to eat and drink, be blessed and broken. Jesus broke the bread, blessed it, and told the disciples to remember Jesus also poured drink, blessed it, and said their memories would serve them. In the story about feeding a multitude, Jesus asked that people bring to him what they had. You have done that today. In your many kitchens and living rooms, Rest your hands lightly upon these elements, which we set aside today to be a sacrament. We ask God's blessing on them to make them enough, and also to make them abundant for us and for all those who are in our prayers this morning. Let us join together in our prayer of consecration. God of compassion, you bless and break everything we are and everything we bring to you. Our deep scarcity becomes enough to sustain us, and then our enough becomes an abundance we could never imagine. We pray that your spirit of life and love, of tenderness and power, rest upon every bread and every cup, that they may feed the inmost need of each child of God and pour forth a grace that can change the world. Risen Christ, live in us, that we may live in you. Amen. The bread on your table is blessed and broken like the picnic of grace. Sharing love, we will never be hungry. The cup on your table is blessed and shared, like the overflowing of tears and joy. Drinking deeply, we will never thirst.
Thanksgiving for the meal that heals yesterday and the unexpected grace that empowers tomorrow. We pray for the wisdom to give away as fast as possible some 12 baskets of leftovers. Please join me in prayer. O Holy, Holy One, one as, as we receive, receive this sacrament in the holy dispersion of virtual worship, we thought we ordered from a select gourmet menu, and never expected to become the curbside pickup of your love and justice, of your compassion and courage, of your hope and healing for all of your children who need a meal in a deserted place. Help us gather the leftovers from the miracles in our lives and give them away. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In our biblical story today, we hear that change is possible. Even change when we are reluctant. Sometimes we just need a nudge. The gifts given to First Congregational UCC do just that. They provide the resources necessary to nudge us and others to do better, to provide more hospitality and to make change in our community and beyond. Ordinary gifts can be made via the website, through Realm, or by mail. Sweet the sound that saves. 
Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at the wedding in Cana, Jesus was reluctant, but he turned water into wine, and meant many witnessed the miracle. God, we are sometimes reluctant to offer our gifts. Help us to be generous, not only with our material possessions, but with our compassion and our advocacy. May these ordinary gifts that we offer today become extraordinary means of ministry in this community and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Even though Jesus was about to make a big change with his presence and his ministry, he showed momentary resistance. But with a nudge, he did it. And we are forever grateful for the changes he made, for the ministry he modeled, and for always bringing us back to love of God and neighbor. In those times when change is difficult for us, help us to listen to the voices that will nudge us to make the changes we are called to make in this world. Help us to serve the best in equity, justice, and peace. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>